Hi, my name is Desiree Bridge. I also go by Desi, which is how most people uh, will refer to me. I was just explaining to some of you, I work over at Bald Head Island at the Conservancy. My background is I have a degree as a historian, mainly focused in public history. I've worked in tourism since I graduated my first time in college in 2004, so going on almost 20 years now. I also have a degree as a baking and pastry chef. I merged my history and food and became a food historian. And this basically came from years working at historical sites, mainly at Old Salem Museum and Gardens in Winston-Salem. And when I was in that department, I focused mainly on food and medicinal. And they crossed paths throughout history, just like today. You might drink orange juice, one, because you like the flavor, and two, because you're trying to get vitamin C, or you might be buying the orange juice where they're adding calcium and other vitamins into it. So uh, it's not a new philosophy, what you put into your body is supposed to help. Now today's talk, which is basically we're talking about scents and perfumes and incense throughout history, they're going to intermingle in with not only was it a, a ritual practice or maybe you were trying to attract a mate by using a scent, uh, scents are also going to have a dual purpose in what you were putting on your skin, what you were breathing in was supposed to be helping with maybe an ailment you had. A lot of these ingredients would also be worked into food. Lavender is a prime example. You would be using lavender as an antiseptic on your skin. You would use lavender to help relax, just like we do today. And it was a popular uh, flavoring agent in the regions that it was natively grown. And then it became such a popular flavor and scent that as people traveled and moved, they took the plant with them. It cultivated and naturalized in different areas. So, for instance, today it's one of the reasons we have lavender over here in the States. Now, when perfume and fragrance and incense first came about, we don't know. But we do have on record the first person who ever did or whoever was considered a chemist. And this is in Iraq, in Babylon. This is 1200 BC. So this is going to be about 3,200 years ago. I am probably, forgive me, going to butcher this name, Taputi, T-A-P-P-U-T-I. It is a female. So ironically, our first chemist we have written down in record is a female. She worked within the courts. She created perfumes. She looked after the household. And a lot of what she's going to be creating, what you're going to see in various parts of Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, is going to be incense, almost poultice-like resins, and scented oils. They're not going to be using aerosol sprays like we think of perfume today. That's going to come much later on. Typically, your scents are going to be very, very heady and very strong during this time period. Um, I've often heard people say, well, that's because they didn't bathe back then. That's, that's thrown around way too much. Yes, you do have errors where people did not bathe quite like we do today, but soap is a very early invention by humankind. Water basins and sponges, water sources, if you had access to it, it all really came down to the individual. It came down if you had the time. And for those that could afford the luxury of actually having a bath prepared for them, especially in ancient times, you do see people bathing and anointing themselves with scented oils. You may, in ancient Egypt, go to certain locations and see hieroglyphics and murals where it looks like a person has like a cone on their head. It's a scented bee comb. It's still debated today. Um, I've seen just way too many people saying, well, this was melt down the cone in the heat and coat their wig or their hair and it gave off a beautiful scent. I've seen other um, historians and archeologists say, no, no, it was solely used during funerary rites. We're not sure what the probably original application of the scented bees cone wax on their head would have been used for, but the main thing is, is as it's melting down, you're not only getting the scent of honey, you probably would have seen into it two resins that most people have heard of, frankincense and myrrh. If you've ever had a chance to just smell frankincense or myrrh alone, the actual resin itself crushed, not an incense form, but the actual resin itself, it is an amazing scent. 
Um, it's hard to explain. It's sort of like explaining to someone what patchouli smells like and sandalwood. You either know what they smell like and you either love them or hate them. But it's, it's in the line of what I would call a honey scent. It's very warm, it's very inviting. There's a bit of a woodsy undertone to it. It's not, at least to my scent, um, it's not very piney at all. You're going to see them cultivating these resins from the trees that they can be extracted from. And they are very expensive. Um, it's not an easy process to cultivate frankincense and myrrh. So that's why we see it pop up in the Bible. But that's also why we see it pop up throughout history as being considered a luxury item. Honey was also used throughout history uh, for scent. And even today, a lot of perfumes will use honey, which typically has some kind of vanilla note to it as kind of a warming base in their perfumes and colognes and fragrances. Amber, which think of the precious, semi-precious stone, which is actually fossilized resin, was heated and the oil extracted would have been used in ancient times as a scent. Amber, though, is sometimes in records a little mixed up with something else called ambergris. Has anyone ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Amber will float up on beaches, so will ambergris. Ambergris is a byproduct from the sperm whale. Sperm whales consume squids. Squids have beaks. Now, usually, not to get into too much gross detail, they try to vomit back out the bits of the squid that the sperm whale will not easily digest. But sometimes, that harder cartilage will go down into their intestinal area. Uh, science is still today really trying to figure out what happens with ambergris, whether the sperm whale just naturally passes it, if it ends up becoming an obstruction and they end up dying from having this growing amount of calcium in their system. The odd thing is, is once it's in the ocean and it starts to oxidize, as it starts to have a chemical reaction to the salt water itself, it starts changing color and it starts becoming more of a, of a waxy substance and it also starts developing a scent. And depending on whether you're getting white, black, or gray ambergris, and this is going to depend on how long it has been exposed to the elements, you're almost going to get a very musky, lovely, wooded scent to it. It's something we really would not think of today. You wouldn't want to, you know, in a modern sense, pick some up and, and smear it on your skin and say, this is lovely. But throughout history, this was a salt after scent to be used in perfumes by itself, in an incense, used for religious rituals and such like that. Now, it's a rare item until the 1800s. And I think everyone knows what happens in the 1800s. The whaling uh, business takes off. And that is really when people put two and two together and went, ah, this isn't sea foam that's hardened in the ocean or some other thought process. This actually comes from the sperm whale. So for along with hunting the sperm whale for their oil, you then see an uptick of them looking for the ambergris. Uh, today, oftentimes in perfumes, what they're using is a synthetic version, but you can still see people hunting for it on the beaches and finding it and using it. And of course, these are gonna be your extremely, extremely expensive um, ointments that are going to have ambergris in it because it, it's not that common of a commodity to wash up on your beaches. Another strange scent that would have been used throughout history, and I think we've all heard of it one way or another, is musk. Musk can come from a gland from various animals. Muskrat is one. Mainly though, they were extracting musk from the musk deer, which is native to Asian or Asianic regions. The deer sadly is not going to survive um, the process and it's a male deer. So today, again, most of the time you're getting musk, which I have musk over there, it's either a synthetic version or it's a botanical version. So the one that you'll be able to smell later is actually a botanical version of musk. The reason why musk was so popular is considered an aphrodisiac. 
And that's another thing throughout history. You want your scents to make you smell good, make you smell inviting to someone that you're trying to attract, and also maybe add a little bit of, of heat to the bedroom if it's, it's getting a little cooler in there. Um, one another reason why though musk is so popular is typically it's usually pleasant on most people. I don't know if you've ever come across this before, but you might smell something on a friend and say, oh my God, what is that? That's amazing. You go and buy it, you put it on yourself and it does not smell good. Your body chemistry is going to change that scent. You can't help it. There are scents that I adore and I put it on my skin and I smell like a medicine cabinet. Or even worse, it can have a uric scent to it. And I'm like, okay, no, we're washing this off. I'm never going to use this scent again. Um, but musk, typically, especially the botanical musk, it's, it's gender neutral. Both men and women use it. And it often ends in a very clean scent. So it's a very, to me, soapy, lovely smell. When a person uses just the right amount of it, they almost smell like they've been freshly laundered and even aired out in the sun. It's, it's just an inviting scent and it is a very safe scent, which is another reason why a lot of folks enjoy it. Um, oftentimes people do not have allergic reactions when they're near someone if they're wearing just a little bit of it. Now, back to strange scents and attracting a mate. Historically, this is something I've been coming across lately. You, you hear of courtesans throughout history of various cultural groups. And they were known for using natural pheromones, which I have also over there, a perfume you'll be able to smell that has botanical pheromones in it. And they would use these to, of course, attract someone to maybe socially climb or just keep their position, let's say at court. Um, we're now finding out that some courtesans throughout history were actually using their own urine yeah. as an aphrodisiac because it is going to have a lot of your body chemistry in it. So they would maybe take it and just anoint it on themselves or they may process it further, maybe uh, concentrating it down, mixing it with maybe some beeswax or other resins. It's very ironic because, and I can't think of the name of the courtesans right now, I'm afraid I did not write down their names, but um, they would be women that if you read any books, especially the French court, the English courts, even further back, it's a name you would be familiar with. And it's always the same. The court is like, what is, what is it about this courtesan that we cannot get the king, let's say, away from? And you'll look and you're like, fascinating. <laughs> she is using a pheromone, basically, to help enhance things. Now, the science with pheromones and whether they work or not, it, it's, it's still evolving, it's still growing, and it comes down to the fact that, again, it's your body chemistry. Some people naturally put off a ton of pheromones, a ton of testosterone. They're just, it just oozes off of them. They're often the people that you meet and you talk to them, and not only do they have a wonderful personality, but you just find yourself being pulled into their presence. And they may not necessarily be what we would consider a classically beautiful or handsome person. There's just something about them that's pulling you in. But there are also botanical and animal and uh, synthetic pheromones that people will use. Now, I have to admit I'm on the hedge on whether pheromones are work or not. I have a perfume with botanical pheromones in it because I love the smell of this perfume. I bought it because as a historian, it's also based on an old love conjuring perfume. So I found that fascinating. The, it's called um, Come To Me, which is the name of it. Listen to the ingredients. Rose, peach blossom, cardamom, figs, pink peppercorn, orris root, vanilla, tonka beans, cashmere, white amber, musk, white patchouli, and botanical pheromones. And there's a couple other ingredients in there. That's like almost all of my favorite scents on this planet. That was going to pull me in immediately, especially if you tell me there's cardamom and figs in there. If you have ever used the spice cardamom, it's just a wonderful scent. It's warm like cinnamon, but a cooler scent. Um, it just makes everything smell and taste a little sweeter. 
If you've ever been lucky enough to be near a fig shrub at the height of summer, and you don't even need those figs on there, the leaves themselves just give off the most wonderful scent when they warm up in the sun. And to me, they just create a warm, fuzzy feeling. It reminds me of either being in a kitchen and making up one of my favorite cookies, which are called jumbles, or it reminds me of my time in Old Salem. I used to walk in the evenings, especially in the summertime, and Old Salem, I don't know, I haven't been there in a while, but it used to have quite a few fig shrubs throughout the community. And when you would walk, you would just get this blast of that warm scent, and it's green and it's lush, and it just makes you think of a happy, happy summer's day. Whether or not when I wear this perfume, I'm attracting more people than usual, I can't tell you. Because the other thing that happens is when oftentimes we find a scent that we like, it's just like when you put on an outfit that you enjoy, you feel more confident, you might stand up a little straighter, you might feel a little more brazen than usual. So it's hard to say sometimes if these scents are actually enticing people to you or it's just giving you that little extra bit of like gumption to get out there and be a little more forward than you usually would be. Now they did do some research a couple years ago. It was the Smell and Taste Treatment and Research Foundation of Chicago. And you had scientists there, researchers that were like, we want to find out what scents are the most popular scents for attracting a male and then for attracting a female. Ironically, after going through many and many a scents, and I do have one over there for you to try, they have discovered that women, if you would like to attract a man, you need to do a mixture of pumpkin and lavender. Mm. And it, we, it, it's ironic, but most of the scents they found for men to be attracted to women were food oriented. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I can't say anything about that because I've got a bit. I mean, if a man walked by and he smelled like bacon, I would probably be like, ooh, because uh, I love bacon. So, <laughs> and I mean, like, you could scent a bacon, you know, not like, oh, did you cook that two days ago? But like, if it, if, I mean, if it smells like wood bacon, I might do a double take. Um, for women, they discovered that if men do a combination of licorice and cucumber, uh, I found that very interesting, especially since you meet a lot of people and they either loathe or love licorice, including the scent of it. So I'm not sure if they were doing an extremely strong licorice scent, like black licorice, or if they were doing a more subtle scent like you would get with star anise or anise, which to me has a bit of a, a greener note to it. It falls more into like the cardamom family itself. Now that said, it's, it's just like our, um, our body chemistry. Everyone's refractory gland works differently. So someone may sit there and put on a scent of lavender and your friend might say, oh, that smells wonderful. Someone next to that person's nose may not be that strong and they may shrug and go, sure, you smell like lavender. And then you might have a third party who has an extremely sensitive nose that will look at you and go, how much did you put on today? So <laughs> that comes into the whole how one uses scents. Now, I personally think throughout history, using a scent in the form of the traditional almost poultices and resins that you were putting on the body oils is almost your better way of putting your scent on your body. It's going to be closest to the skin, it's going to react to your body chemistry, it's going to react to your body heat, and it's going to create this tiny little pocket of scent around you that people have to either be intimate with you, whether it's a close friend or a lover, or they have to just walk past you to get that scent. What worries me with um, perfumes that you spray on is how often people tend to become nose blind to it. It's like how we add salt or sugar to various things. We might become so accustomed to the taste we just keep adding. Sometimes when one is spraying a scent on, that can happen. And they may, uh, Chanel number five, prime example, one spritz, just one spritz, wherever you want to put it. Some people bathe in it and they wear the lotion and they wear the body wash and that's great. If you're not doing that one spread though, 
they'll walk through that door and stand here and be like, ooh. <laughs> it's, uh, it can be a bit overwhelming. So I have to admit, I'm, I'm not so sure if, um, if Modern Perfume came about in 1889. Uh, I think it's a good thing in the sense that it did make it easier to mass produce and it did bring the price down. But again, I have to, you'll notice all the scents that I use over there, not a single one of them comes in a spray. Um, when I was younger, in my early 20s, I did use body sprays and a combination I ironically found that worked beautifully for me and attracted people was orange and spearmint. I don't know what it was about that scent in my body chemistry, but that was a scent that whenever I wore it, I got compliments all the time. But as I got older, I discovered that if I use body oils and carrying oils like you would have seen historically, and I also have been looking at old recipes and wanting to experiment and try them on myself, I found the easiest thing to do was to go with single note extracts or just to carry oil like um, vitamin E oil, apricot oil, something that has no scent or a very subtle scent and then you drop a little on and use that as your lotion and your body spray and everything all in one and it one has a longer staying power it's cheaper and i found that i can be around and i deal with the public people who have extreme asthma sensitivities reaction whatever i've never had anyone complain and say, I can't be working with you right now, or I can't deal with you right now. Not in a mean way, but be like, you're just triggering something within my senses. And I think today we just, we, we just get a little too overwhelmed with synthetic and, and fake scents and, and such, and aerosols. And we're in a, an era, ironically, where any type of scent that does not fall into what we consider a pleasant scent, we just almost have a shutdown and I will grab out any spray we can just to spray that space as quickly as possible. Now I've mentioned musk and I've mentioned all the the rarer, not as commonplace items that would have been used historically, but then there's a lot of plants that have had staying power. Roses have been used for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, rose water, again, I mentioned earlier how you would see people using things for cosmetic scent and food. How many in here have baked with rose water or cooked with rose water? It's really quite pleasant. Um, how many in here have had Turkish Delight? Nope. All right. If you've had Turkish Delight, it's typically uh, a rose water flavor, maybe orange water. It can go back and forth. Um, rose water was used prior to vanilla as your main kind of like floral flavoring agent if you could get your hands on it. It's also good for helping with um, eczema, other types of skin issues that might cause redness or little bumps under the skin. So it would often be used as a tonic on the face. And then people would often uh, consume it because they thought it would help with any type of throat issue, oral problems. In fact, frankincense and myrrh were also used heavily for oral problems. And even today, you're seeing organic natural toothpaste coming out with frankincense and myrrh in it. Reason we're not as familiar in America today with rose water is because something was discovered in Mexico, and that's going to be around 1519 with your conquistadors coming into that country. Now, Europeans first come in contact with vanilla in 1519. Your native peoples of Mexico were very much aware of vanilla for a very, very, very long time. They had learned to hand cultivate it, and they were actually growing it on farms by the time your conquistadors come over. Vanilla was used for food, it was used for medical treatments, but mainly people enjoyed the scent of vanilla. And even today, the most popular scent in the world is vanilla. Depend it doesn't matter what cultural group you're from. If they've gone into an area and let's say they found a group who has never experienced vanilla before and have very types of scents for them to try, most of the time the people will point as vanilla as the most inviting and pleasant scent out of the grouping. Now, vanilla is going to be smuggled out of Mexico at one point in its history, and then you're going to start seeing it 
popping up along the equator on various islands and other areas, which is why today, you go to some place like Williams and Simone or something like that, there's Mexican vanilla, Madagascar vanilla, vanilla from here, vanilla from there. And that's because your vanilla is going to change a bit to the region that it's growing in. But also, Mexico is the only place where you're going to have the native bee that was able to pollinate vanilla. Anywhere else, vanilla is grown today in the world. It is still hand pollinated. Reason why vanilla is expensive, the reason why we put it in alcohol to dilute it just a bit, is it only opens once. It's not a flower that's going to be open for a couple days. So ironically, something that we consider very mundane and easy to come by is an extremely difficult plant to work with, which is why on the market, a lot of people will buy synthesized or fake vanilla. Um, it's cheaper and a lot of folks just are going to look at the price point for a true strong like vanilla bean paste and say I'm not going to go for that. I, I'm using way too much of it. It's too expensive. Vanilla is like lavender. It can either go really well on your skin or it can go really bad. It took me 20 some years to finally find a vanilla that I can actually wear and it wears beautifully all day long, and I will, poor people near me, I'll be like, how's it still smell? And I'm like, is it on medicine? How do I smell? I'm like, you smell like vanilla. I'm like, good. I can only wear vanilla if it's mixed with bourbon. I don't know why. I do have found it. It is a body oil, and it's a vanilla bourbon mix. Bourbon was one of your first, uh, bourbon and other types of alcohols were one of your first stabling agents that you see them using in perfumes pretty early on. So you have a kind of a 13, what was it, 1370, somewhere in that ballpark. You have the Queen of Hungary using a, what we would call a perfume today, but it was almost a multi-purpose liquid called Hungry Water. And it is considered the <coughs> oldest recipe in a modern perfume sense. One of the original concoctions called for rosemary, thyme, and brandy. Again, yeah, brandy is going to act as the stabilizer and preservative. Later on, we see wine, lavender, mint, sage, marijuana, and even orange blossoms and uh, lemon added to it, along with a type of thistle. Vinegar could also be used as a stabilizer and a preservative for various scents. Now, most of your concoctions that are made with a vinegar base tend to be more like cleaning agents. And in fact, vinegar is working its way back into um, households today. Uh, vinegar is a good thing to have in the sense that it can kill some pathogens, but it's typically going to be it's not going to be like COVID. It's going to be more like colds and flus like that. Vinegar being mixed with botanicals, though, has a very interesting history. Has anyone ever heard of um, the vinegar of four thieves? Yes. I actually have over there uh, my own version of it because there's 5,000 versions of it. It's a vinegar base. It's typically going to be a white vinegar base, but you can also see apple cider vinegar being used, whichever you could readily get historically. It then has a mixture of various types of herbs in it. The reason it's called the vinegar of four thieves was because you had the bubonic or black plague spreading through France, yet again. And what you have are four thieves who were using a concoction of vinegar and herbs and raiding homes and stealing jewelry and other items from those either who had already succumbed to the bubonic plague or had died or were dying of the bubonic plague. When they were captured by authorities, they were like, how are you surviving? <laughs> how is it you have not succumbed? And at first they wouldn't talk and then it was, all right, well, here's the deal. You're either going to be tortured and we'll find out what it is or will be humane and give you a quick death. They opted for the quick death, and they gave up a list of various types of herbs. In fact, I've got one of them over there that you'll be able to look, like, or look at, wormwood. A lot of the plants they were using were antibacterial, antimicrobial. We don't know if, in all fairness, 
the mixture of herbs and the vinegar were protecting them. It could be these were just four very lucky people. Maybe they had extremely strong immune systems, but you see from that era on down various recipes for the vinegar of four thieves. It will pop up in many different types of book. I even saw a traditional book for butlers where they had a whole section for household goods, cleaning, even a vinegar for cleaning one's feet because you cannot let one's feet become stinky. Mm -hmm. um, but in that mixture was vinegar of four thieves to clean a room, a sick chamber, basically. Um, when you smell it, for most people today, when they smell a, a concoction of vinegar or four thieves, we immediately think of salad dressing. And that's because we're just used to vinegar and herbs when they're mixed together. They add a little olive oil and then you put it on your salad. But this, this version that I made up, I actually find kind of pleasant. I don't think I'd be using it on my body, but I wouldn't mind using it as a cleaning agent in the home. It has dianthesis in it, it has southern wood in it, lavender, and thyme. Um, southern wood, and I have, so, or southern wood, I have some over there for y'all to smell, is an amazing herb. If you can get your hands on it, get it in your garden. Um, it is going to smell beautiful as you go into summer and that sun hits it. It's very heaty. I find it very clean. Uh, it's a scent I wouldn't necessarily ever want to wear, but it was a scent that was used for laundry. And when you smell it, you might think of a dryer sheet. It, it's, it's something that you're immediately going to think, oh, this would smell good on cotton or maybe linen, especially if it's dried out in the sun. People are surprised sometimes when I mention thyme. Uh, we really just think of thyme today as something you put in savory dishes. If you're brave, maybe in sweet dishes. But thyme is actually one of the world's oldest cultivated plants. It's native to, native to the Mediterranean. Um, and it's also one of the oldest scents that we see kind of popping up. It would have been used historically in funeral rites. It was also used as an oil for achy joints. We see the scent being popular, more so for men than women, but both seem to be using it. And it was also believed to help keep nightmares away. So it was a very multi-purpose herb. Also, for such a tiny little herb, it was considered the herb of courage. So you often saw Roman soldiers using time to just kind of give them that little bit extra oomph before they headed out into the battlefield. And we actually can thank the Romans for the spread of time. They were the ones that were going to take it with them as they went on to their different encampments. Now, I have gone through a whole wide range of different scents and, and different perfumes and such like that. You do see most of the time in history, there was this belief that it was single notes, but as I've mentioned, you've got Hungry Water, you've got Vinegar of Four Thieves, there's a couple others. There are certain companies today that will say they invented the first multi-scented perfume and such like that. I don't know if they did or didn't, but historically we do see people mixing scents, but typically you are going to probably just go with like a frankincense oil or you might go with a lavender oil to kind of keep yourself scented. I'm actually going to end the talking part up here a little early because I'd like to move us over to this section over here and start talking about the various things we have and have you all smell them and, and continue the discussion that way because I can only explain it so much from my perspective and what my nose is. I'd like to hear what you all think about the various scents over there. I did bring a magnolia in today for my tree. Sadly, I do not have a strong scented magnolia, but the magnolia typically used today in perfumes, it's either going to be the giant North American magnolia, or it's going to be a breed of magnolia from China. And one of the reasons people love magnolia is it has a lemony orangey scent for a flower itself. And not only the flower would have been used, but also you can use the twigs, the burk, and also the leaves. It exudes this beautiful scent to it. So if you actually want, let's head over here. All right, 
want to come up? Yes, everything. <laughs> if you all are wanting to come on up, let's get the blood going in our legs again. <laughs> you want us to bring the scent to you? You want us to bring it to you? Uh, I can do that if you want. Okay, I'll come up there. All right. Thank you. All right, so the first one y'all are going to be scenting is the pumpkin and lavender. So. It's it's pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I know. It's uh because I get the pump it's hot sulfur. Yeah, my only concern about the views when you go in public buildings now. Yes. There will be a sign up the day of your office days to do not use body or the Yes. Yeah, that's yes. Yes. Whatever. You know what exactly. Yeah. With my curly hair, I wear a lot of hair product and I smell like bananas because of the product. <laughs> that's the one that draws men to women? Yes. You say? Yeah. <laughs> <That's exactly. laughs> I like Yeah. I thought I had some men here. <laughs> To admit, it's uh, it was pumpkin and pumpkin and lavender, lavender. and there's some there's some mosquitoes on it. Yeah, yeah, and you know it, it will have some spices to it, like your cinnamon and nutmeg and stuff like that, typically. But it's one of those scents that I, I originally was a little nervous. I like food scented perfumes and oils and such, but it's like I don't know. And I put it on, and I think both men and women, because women actually find this scent very attractive too. Coming up and you're just like, you smell really good. And one man did go, you smell like Thanksgiving. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I'll take that. I'm smelling more nutmeg than that. More nutmeg? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And well, and that's the fascinating thing too, is everyone's nose is going to pick up on something a little different, which is why you can have a tried and true big name brand perfume or cologne. Let's pick all spice for gentlemen. You now have women wearing Old Spice, mm -hmm. and that's because women and men are finding that you can mix these scents and they're gonna react differently to your body chemistry. We kind of, in this country, we tend to categorize things a little too much in a modern sense. Sweet and savory, you can't ever mix them. They have to be separate. And it's the same with scents. Like I said, this musk that I have here is great on both men and women. It's just a clean scent. Now this is the one that has floral botan or floral pheromones in it. This is the one that's based on a, a love potion. And actually these little bottles that I have here, you can find the sellers on Etsy. Um, I feel like I should ask their permission, so I'm not really saying what their name is, but feel free to take pictures if you like the stuff. And go on my <laughs> I should have probably said, hey, I'm doing a disclaimer. I'll be using your scents because I'm addicted to them and I love that you're doing the whole historical thing with them. Oh, that's nice. Now that one, though, if you read reviews on it, it either has staying power or people have said, I love the scent, but it did not last on my body. So, and it's, it seems to be for me, I've got staying power on that one, but I've had other scents that I thought were beautiful and magical and I smell good for 15 minutes, and then if I smell my skin again, and I've had other people smell, the scent is totally gone. I don't like that. I do. You don't know, so I like that. It's not what you're making. Do you like it? Yeah. yeah. That's it's very cool. cool. All right, so we're going to get a sharp, sharp awakening to our nose. This is the vinegar, scented vinegar. So go ahead, and if you don't want to stick your nose right over it, you can do the waft. So that's the vinegar of four thieves. Now, who, who, got, who wore this? this? Who were the thieves that wore that, or a version of this, when they were basically stealing from the dead during the bubonic plague in France? Isn't Weren't they oil merchants? merchants? Hmm? Weren't they oil merchants? And that does remind you of the oil. On it does. The oh, that's still I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Most of what I'm reading, I have to admit, I'm horrible. I'm not read really too much on them. I'm more interested in the recipe itself. Oftentimes when you have essential oils, that's one of the options. Mm -hmm. This doesn't smell like my fortune. And they will let you put it in there to clean with. Mm -hmm. That has the southern wood in it. And the southern wood is going to do, mm -hmm, do a nice little change on it. All right. And then just to play with your nerves a little bit, here's the concoction without the vinegar. So go ahead and smell 
what all those smell like without a vinegar tone to it. Can you smell anything? Is that dianthus? Mm-hmm. That has dianthus, lavender, thyme, and the southern wood in it. So I, ironically, I find the vinegar brings the scent potent. more potent. You're yes. pulling out those essential smell oils. Smells sweet. Mm -hmm. And that's the fascinating thing with dianthus is some people yeah. incarnations, some people will say it smells sweet, others say it smells spicy. To me, they have a very, very peppercorny scent. It's, it's spicy to me, but then I've met other folks that are like, oh no, no, it's more of a creamy, sweet scent that I smell when I, I smell a carnation. All right, so next up is going to be our musk. Mm, my favorite. And this is, I will say this, is a big corporation. Everyone may have even come across at the body shop. This is their white musk that they make. And they'll use that as a base and then they'll add various notes to it for other things. Musk is one of those where, especially if you're going with a botanical musk, people may not like the scent in the bottle, but the minute they put it on their skin, mm -hmm. they'll fall in love with it. I actually came across that when I did my study abroad in England. I wasn't able to take over the perfume I was wearing at that time, which was, I, I was wearing ginger essence from Origins. It literally smelled like just ginger, and I loved it. I went into a body shop in the town I was living in, and they had that, and the young woman in there was like, try it, try it, try it, and I was sniffing it, I was like, I don't know. I was like, this just doesn't smell like me. I'm like 21, I was like, uh. So I tried a little on my arm, and I was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> Like, this is amazing. And I was actually dancing at that time. Um, I always leave it out because I don't utilize it anymore. I also have a degree as a dance choreographer. And so I liked it because I could put just a little on and do it right. <laughs> go through a dance class with no air conditioning and come out and smell okay. <laughs> People weren't like, oh. <laughs> Have you been dancing for almost two hours in a non-air-conditioned building? They were like, oh, you smell like you just took a shower. I'm like, this is great. Wow. This works for, for my body chemistry. I'm going to keep with this. Now, fruit is also something you're going to see pop up a lot. Peaches are a popular scent. Also, as an... As a, I can't speak anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, keep in mind, I think as you look at a peach, you can put two and two together and figure out why that fruit. It's for light things and why certain fruits are often put into the category as a, a fruit. I know. Does that not smell amazing? Sadly, that is one that has no staying power. Oh, does it smell good? <laughs> but the reason I'm having you smell this one, that is what I smell when fig leaves get hot in the sun. To me, it has a very, very, very peachy oh, scent. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's about <laughs> as close as I ever got to a perfume like that kind of yeah. brings that memory forward. That smells so good. I can imagine that returns some heads. Yes. Like I said, it only lasts about 15 minutes on me though, sadly. So that's more of a memory scent memory. that I do. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of memory scent, do you all have a scent that just triggers a fond memory? A lot of people do, some people Mine's don't. Mine's musk. Musk? Yeah, because I used it in 1971, yeah. is when I found it. <laughs> and it would be funny because I didn't put a lot on, but when I would walk past patients, they'd be, what's that? <laughs> Men and women, though. Yeah. There would be women. This one girl just got up and kept following me. I'm like, what are you doing? She's just, it's okay. I'm like, oh, no. I think it's called White Boar. Yes. That perfume, that is a great perfume. It has great staying power. And yeah. I've had women walk by and I'm like, oh, what are you wearing? That smells amazing. It is a very good And they'll be like, White Door. And I'm mm -hmm. like, the Red Door. I'm like, huh. All right, now this one is a whole bunch of resins. This has frankincense, this has myrrh in it. So, this is going to be more of a, a it has honey in it, a traditional scent that you would have come across if you were walking into some type of ritual where they were burning incense, they had mm -hmm. hot resins and such like that. So to me, 
I'm probably very wrong in saying this, but whenever I'm reading up about your Mononan culture or reading about Egypt or any of your ancient Mediterranean cultural groups, for some reason, this is what I imagine yeah. a, a ritual this smelling like. Favorite. It also has sandalwood in it and a couple others. And cinnamon. Mm -hmm. You will get Which is one of my favorite. I know everyone's nose probably right now is like... What I can the smell them all. Yeah. Yeah. Should have bought baked goods. Yeah, I should have bought. <laughs> you can make. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think like they used to wear. Um, what they think they used to wear. They smell good. They all smell good to me, though. Yes, it kind of has that scent to it. Mm. What's yes, the something. difference between a scent and a tone? Mm. A tone is going to be more subtle in my experience. A scent is typically, a scent can be a mixture or a single note. Tones can also be a single note. Um, I just feel like scents have staying power. They're, they're a stronger blend, a concentration, um, but it's also probably my own biasness because I've never had a great experience with with tones as a as lasting long on me. It's kind of I tend to go with essential oils and then basically mix it with other things. Um, speaking of a strong scent, I am going to have you all try the southern wood real quick, and then I promise anything else you want to smell, you can do on your own accord. I'm I'm done kind of assaulting your noses. Um, I did though mention early. Uh, wormwood. I grow this in my garden. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons it kind of has that name is it would often curl in onto itself, but this was used to treat intestinal worms, a couple other problems, but today it's used in perfume manufacturing because it gives a nice green woody scent to it. So this is another one of these plants that in a modern sense today, most people overlook at a garden shop. They don't even think about putting in their yard, but you would have seen this in colonial gardens, gardens up into the 1800s, way back in history. This was a pretty important herb that you had. Um, same with southernwood. Um, that had a very popular use for medicinal. It would have been used quite heavily as a strewing herb in sick chambers, and you'll see why as you smell it. It's very potent and it's very strong. You didn't have hospitals historically. If you were ill, you were gonna succumb usually at home and your family's gonna do everything they can to make that space clean and smell better, especially if one is dying and bodily fluids basically are passing freely. I don't know why this one has fallen out of, I know, favor. I like that. Mm -hmm. I, came across, I never heard of it until I worked at Old Salem Museum and Gardens. And we had it in a garden and I kept touching it and I looked at the little sign. And um, we recently went up to Shelton's herb farm oh, up in Leland. Yes. And she had that growing there. I was like, oh my God, yes. I'm getting me some of that and I'm getting that back into my garden. Does it smell when you go in your garden? Okay. It you does. You don't have to get down in the smell. No. Well, it depends on the time of the year and what I've got going. Right now, my wax myrtle is just finishing its bloom cycle, and I've got two, three, four, five, five growing in the yard. They came with the property. Um, once that will kind of go down, my herbs will start taking over scent-wise. Um, I try to grow plants that are going to be pretty much as one goes, another will come into its place. Problem I have with a lot of modern hybrids uh, today is some of them may not have a scent or it's, it's a scent that I may not be able to pick up. Uh, I prefer using heirloom breeds as, as much as possible. I also feel like they have a little stronger staying power. They may not be the most beautiful. They might get a little spotty. They may get a little droopy but I'm okay with that. So right now, when you walk out into the yard, the herbs are still babies. They're not really doing too much and the sun hasn't gotten hot enough to really get their essential oils to the surface and scent it. It is the wax myrtle you're smelling. 
Um, you're also smelling, if you have enough of them, pansies will put off a scent. I've got a plethora of pan pansies right now going through their final bloom. I have some roses that are going through a broom cycle right now. So it's a more floral scent. Um, I miss pine scent. I don't have any pine trees in my yard except for a baby one up front, but when I lived in King, North Carolina, we had a massive white pine out front. And along with producing all the pine needles that I needed for gardening, mm -hmm. I just I got covered in resin. But I just loved going into that tree, especially in the fall. Just like yeah. breathing that in with that crisp air. There was just a scent that was mm -hmm. unbelievable to that one. Does the wormwood have a scent to it? Sweet. It's, Sweet. A, very, it's a very subtle scent. Is that what they made absent at all? Mm -hmm. absent? It is, yes. Or the green fresh. fairy. Yeah. <laughs> and then it will release the oil. Yeah. Well, this is a bit yes. different. Yes. Has anyone in here ever had absinthe? No. It's is it still problem. illegal? I mean, it's no, not it's not illegal. illegal. Not illegal. It is, it's, uh, if it's produced properly, it is not dangerous to the health. Um, it's, that it's was the issue there. with it. Think of bathtub gin. You know, if you're not making your gin properly. <laughs> You're gonna cause people to go blind among other things yeah. when prohibition was about. Um, absence, ironically, at least the version I tried, and this was in Charlotte, it was legal. Okay. It was at a bar, yeah. a very legal bar. <laughs> um, it was an extremely strong licorice flavor. It was, it was a bit syrupy, I will say this. It was extremely potent. I didn't finish it. Well, I, won't. I was not driving, I will say that too. Okay. And it was one of those I tried, and I, will, I did do it for historical reasons and went, never again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I could, it, it was strange. We'll just say that there was a bit more going on than um, beer goggle feel yeah. going on there. Yes. I so. wondered, I wondered, because I had one chance and I missed it. I was in Prague. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, just historically, just but I didn't get a chance. I'm yeah. Like, well, like, no big deal. It's probably going to knock me out anyway. I tell you what, the, the bartender was great because he's like, you have someone driving you, right? He's like, my sister and brother-in-law. <laughs> and so he's like, good. And they're like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs>